from what I experience as good writing, there's like a truth telling aspect to it that makes things work well uh, and touch people. That universality comes from truth telling. And I think that you can't yeah. tell the truth without bouncing it off of other humans to make sure it's the truth, you know? Right, right, because right. Because I think the first draft can be about like telling my truth, healing my wound. What is my feeling? <laughs> yeah, yeah, get it and out. And then it's like... <laughs> It's not fun to just watch your like narcissistic like representation of what your mom did to you. Yeah, you asshole. Therapy. Like yeah. we don't care. And I you're 30. Like figure your shit out. And so I think that there's a requirement to bounce those things off of other people to be like, what's your experience of this topic? And maybe not your experience. You can't know what happened between me and my mom, but you can know about like what happens between children and moms. Yeah. And you can know like how human beings talk about these topics inside of these worlds. And so my point is that I've learned it's really important that if I feel really precious about something, that it's time to like kill my darlings and like send it into I, the, I say it all the my time. network kill and be babies. like, tell me the, tell me the truth. Like what, like fuck the structure and like good writing. Like, is this true? Like, is this honest? Like, right. What's it moving in you? We're always collaborating at all times with the universe. This is going to, I think, segue into my season two <laughs> intro season of like the next uh, awesome. podcast cool. season and season one more time. And uh, so I wanted to introduce you guys. So, I mean, we have Center Film Fest is going on right now. We've got the um, script read is going on today. I just got the script last night. And I was yeah, like, all go. right, let's, let's get go. into it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, just introduce yourselves a little bit and, and sort of tell me a little bit about your guys' backgrounds. Sure. Um, my name is Jeremy Fight. I'm a filmmaker and an actor and a storyteller of many kinds. Um, I'm from central Pennsylvania. I'm from a town called Imler, which is in Bedford County. Imler, yeah. Yeah, so it's great to be uh, back in central PA. <laughs> is it? Is it? It is. It really is. I'm, I'm um, you know, I took a lot of the beautiful parts of this place for granted when I was growing up here, as one does. And yeah. now mm. coming back, it's nice to remember what it feels like and and there's a bit of a tempo shift from the city from new york city so this is my first time sharing work of mine here where i'm from and so that's kind of exciting and terrifying yeah and, yeah, yeah that's awesome uh, and so yeah we're here for the film festival and um making a lot of things in new york started in theater as far as storytelling goes and then during the pandemic really dove into producing some scripts that were just kind of passion, secret passion projects yeah, yeah, on the side. Sure. And so during the pandemic, produced a film called Fever. That's a psychological thriller about mental health and privilege and their impacts on a gay interracial couple. And that did the festival circuit and is now expanding into its own thing. And that's brought a lot of opportunities to continue telling stories. And so Beanie, the film that we're reading today at the festival, is more than likely going to be my first feature. Nice. Yeah. That's awesome. Congratulations. Thanks. It's got to be, it's got to feel extra good, especially yeah. if you're like debuting the script read like here. Yeah. 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 It does feel good. It's, um, yeah, it feels like a, a full circle moment or like a coming back to self moment that I think is going to align some things moving forward. So, yeah. Yeah, it sounds like uh, it's going to be like a pretty grounding sort of aspect of like your career for you. I feel like it's a yeah. good, it's like uh, the slingshot moment, right? Like you get pulled back, right? You just, you get here, you're doing this here. This is the moment where things can kind of. Yeah. And therefore, I don't know if grounded is the word that I would yeah, think. Yeah, you know, yeah, sort of like yeah. terror, like being shot out of a slingshot. Because I feel like I was avoiding for some time my identity as like being a person from this place. You know, I think when you, for me, when I moved to New York almost 10 years ago, there was this like, especially after having come from going to college in Pittsburgh and even there, there was this shame that I carried about being from Central PA um, because of this assumed affiliation with certain sides of the like political climate here, yeah. or, like certain sides of like how that does or does not align with like the highbrow artistic right, right, qualities right. of like the worlds that I was moving through. And so especially as an actor, you know, there's this pressure, I think from a certain angle of the theater world to like cleanse yourself of dialect and like yeah. become this like heightened, like thespian person. Right. And I spent time in acting school, like becoming this sort of like generic, like baseline theater, Jeremy. And I think as I started, yeah, it's an archetype. It's definitely like, yeah, a, a character. I mean, it's a different human. <laughs> and yeah. I think like, I became a different human. And then I think after some time, people were like, mm, you know, it's like super interesting that you like grew up in a trailer park and like, mm, let's get a little more of that. Where's that, Jeremy? And it's funny how 
things have shifted now. And I don't know if that's a culture shift around me or just like, I don't know, a God thing. But I I think I've now come back to, oh, yeah, the impact I can make as a filmmaker is through telling the truth about where I'm from. So. And and that to say, I really am, while I think in the work that I'm writing, have a massive critique of my family, especially in the culture that I grew up in. But I also have a lot of love for it. And I think the ultimate task is figuring out how to showcase the beautiful parts of the humanity here and through that respect of creating that baseline of look these are 360 human beings that have beautiful stories to tell then through that saying okay but you're represented now where what are what are your blind spots you know it's kind of weird and like central pennsylvania is kind of unique in this regard uh my dad lives in saxon so like out towards bedford in mm -hmm, that area so mm -hmm. that is sort of like its own kind of i would say like subcultured area yeah. of this place but there's such a diaspora of experience that yeah. generates so many different types of characters yeah. out of this area yeah and it's really interesting to me to see that this is like like center film fest my first introduction to it was probably right i want to say before during the pandemic, actually, I'm pretty sure I had a, another show I produced and I had, I want to say it was, your name's messing me up. It's not Colette. <laughs> oh, what is her name? I'll think of it later. But she, uh, she came on the show and talked a little bit about it. They were doing it virtual because mm. it was pandemic. Yeah. And uh, I was like, oh, cool. That's going on here. Like I should get involved. I'm not really involved with the filming community in this area because yeah. you just don't think of it statistically being something that takes yeah, place yeah, in this area. Yeah. And then, you know, lo and behold, I meet Pablo randomly on another adventure that we're as, doing. And, as one does. Yeah, yeah. And, and it was like one of the great, it was a super surreal connection because I was like, you're in this area. Like you're doing this and you're producing short films and like, I've never heard of you. And I'm actively involved in this scene and I'm not in the film space, but more in like the YouTube and like yeah. social media, that warehouse space of things. Yeah, yeah. So for me, it was really interesting to sort of meet him and say like, damn, you're in this area, you're doing this and you're bringing this here. Yeah. And so it's nice to see that that's something that uh, he is one kept with, because yeah. I think like in the long run of things it takes to make something like this even possible, it certainly takes characters like Pablo to make yeah. that happen. And and not just one, but like a, a village of idiots to have to come together sure. and assemble to make this happen. So, Colette, yeah. not to hijack it, not introduce no, you at all. Say. Tell me about you a little 45 bit. 45 minutes in. Right. Yeah, no, yeah, I'm yeah. kidding. Um, my name is Colette Gerardin. Um, I'm from New York. I'm a producer and actor. Um, uh, yeah, I, I took about five years off after school to go into the tech space. So nice. I have a experience in marketing and sales in the tech world and building teams and project management. You have like the the uh, tech posture. Isn't that fascinating? I hate that. <laughs> But I it might but even I, be that it might even be the way you speak a little bit. Like you're like just so yeah. clear. So and interesting. Like, yeah. That's fascinating to me. Uh, <laughs> that's the first time I've ever heard that. I don't mind it. Um, I'm going to take that with me. Um, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Just let it linger in the back of your mind for the rest of the day. <laughs> for, for a while. Um, I I think that is a, a big reason why I started producing. I didn't know. I didn't know what producing was. I didn't really care to, to do it um, mm. until I... Jeremy and I have had been friends for a while, a few years. We met as actors and we our relationship was uh, helping each other doing tapes and taking classes. Um, I, it takes a village. It man. does. Like, it does. It takes a village. Uh, we met and uh, we uh, he brought me on to produce his uh, New York City premiere of Fever. And that was our first time working together in a um, high stakes <laughs> high stress <laughs> way and it went really well it went shockingly well and it, once you get to know our <laughs> personalities i know once you get to know us a little bit better i think our friends would also be like really you guys did that yeah uh, that's surprising yeah there's um, something magical about uh, a baptism by fire i feel like where yeah. you, know, you jumped into something you're yeah. in a little over your head there is like a certain amount of information and knowledge it does not seep in without the right amount of like yeah. stress receptors coming it's off true. in your brain yeah I mean, honestly, it's like the only way to do something really I like that. The the magic of like not being overly prepared, I think, actually makes for me actually makes things become what they need to be. Well, because it just it 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 lays off the pressure. Nothing ever is going to be perfect. Never. Things don't happen the way you want them to. Yeah. Ever. I it just really got doesn't. back into town. What's today? 
Wednesday. I got it Monday night, super late, technically Tuesday morning from Denver. I was uh, helping my friend who produced a fashion show based off of, you ever seen the movie True Romance? I know of it. This is like a legendary American cinema Oh yeah, then totally. Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I must. There have been. It's on my I mean, there's. List, certain, yeah. been like, I'm, I'm positive there have that. been like Broadway adaptations <laughs> of it too. But if you if you get a chance, this is a, this is a movie where I think everybody should see it at some point in their lives. It's one of those movies. It's like it should be. If it's not, it should be taught in like film classes. Yeah. But uh, killer roster of people, and so the whole theme of this fashion show was based around that. And so there was like fire performers and like burlesque dancers and like Cirque du Soleil like kind of Whoa. performers, and then all these designers showed up and all these different models. There were like. 50 models, 20 performers, like all in the, all packed into an hour and a half long show. And the guy who was hosting it was from this area. He's a good friend of mine. He asked me to come out and do like an event recap video for him. Hmm. And Oof. so I was like, okay. So I got out there and I didn't, I didn't, I guess realize that it was his first show going into it, but coming out of it, I was like, or going into the day, I was like, oh, fuck, he's having his baptism by fire moment. Like, mm. I need, I'm need. i going to, like, step up and try to help him. So I was there to film, and I didn't really have anything to do until, like, maybe when the models started showing up and getting hair and makeup done around, like, two or three. So I had plenty, I had, like, five hours to help him, like, bark and call and get this venue guy yeah. running this yeah. here. We need trash cans over there. We need where the curtain set up for this. Yeah, like, yeah, there's going to yeah. be naked models back there. We're going to need, like, yeah, this is going to yeah, be blocked yeah, off. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there, there really is something about that that aspect yeah. of jumping into it and having like no knowledge that when you come back on the other mm -hmm. end, everything you've learned is so fucking seared into your brain that it's almost impossible to forget. Totally. And you yeah. carry it with you for totally. sure. For sure. Yeah, totally. So where do you go to school? Um, I went to a small liberal arts school in Maine called Bates College. Okay. Uh, I majored in theater acting there and Spanish. Um, and <laughs> I'm going <laughs> um, and yeah, I graduated in 2016, spent a few years in Boston, the tech world of Boston, and then finally came back home, came back home to New York and really kind of settled into myself and um, what I actually wanted to be doing. And it felt great. So you guys kind of, you met and had been working together kind of like a little bit beforehand, jumping into his production of Fever, right? Well, I, I think most of our experience was was purely acting yeah. together. And really. like friendship. I mean, we started yeah. just as like friends who oh, right. were in acting. Yeah, right. Also that. <laughs> Sorry, what? Yeah, we I think. I mean, we were unpacking. <laughs> yeah, I, I I we're unpacking we go to that therapy. Part. But I think we really should. I think that um Colette and I started as just like actors who appreciated Aiden Jules' work and then ended up living in Bushwick at the same time. And nice. so we were like, well, let's we started, went in Rome. Uh, I mean, yeah. So we started like hanging out and helping each other do actorly things like Clet said. And we really didn't work on anything in particular together until that premiere because Fever was happening at that time when we met already. Like it was already in full swing. We may have even wrapped. No, you wrapped for sure. We were like in post or like do mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. And then um maybe even doing festivals by that point. And so then what happened was the team for Fever um had hopped on all of their various next projects and so there was a an entire like premiere being planned that like i and the just like one of our other teammates were working on and so colette i was like help <laughs> and yeah, yeah. that was my friend you know we were just kind of spending a lot of time together at that point i was my like, head is above you... water right now i'd like to fucking keep it there if we can make that happen <laughs> can you do this are we and homies how like, deep are we homies and oh we showed like, i showed good yeah, showed yeah, yeah. yeah listen man it takes that sometimes yeah. like you need to that's such a surreal experience too, right? Yeah. When you know, like, I'm this is a lot. Not that you're drowning, just that you're what like, you I'm drowning? for sure yeah, in a yeah. place of overwhelmedness. Yeah. And having somebody who can be like, I can help you keep your head afloat. Yeah. Like, yeah, we can do this. Like, yeah. We really built something. It's really, I, I mean, we had built something before that moment. And then that moment was a pivotal a relationship core memory, I think, yeah, yeah. which changed both of us. And then um, I think it was literally two, two weeks, three weeks after he called me and he was like, hey, I have this story. I have this idea. I don't know if it was written at the time. I think some of it was written. I, yeah, I had like started to write dress. he was like. This is a story about me and my grandma, and it's really, this it's is really close to home. Yeah, yeah this is Beanie. Okay. Yeah. And so this is like, cool because, like, wanna... we have the script pre read at, like, what, yeah. 945? Of course. And, yeah, and, yeah, and, just, yeah, yeah. and this was exact, what, what day is it? This is exactly a year ago to 
the day. And almost. not only our decision to do that, that weekend we were, Fever was also screening at the Bushwick Film Festival. Oh, yeah. And there we met uh, two producers who were working with Ombini that weekend who also had a film screening at Bushwick. Um, that one. That one. Uh, oh, yeah, that award. one best short? No, or oh, best narrative gotta, short? We got to know that award, man. Yeah, RJ and Ian. <laughs> Let's put the subtext on the bottom. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> lower thirds. We'll Say the wrong thing so I can put we'll the asterisk like, up on screen. Yeah. Yeah. We like cut to a little teaser like, <laughs> um, for them. But yeah, so they're also here with us for the reading and they'll be yeah. reading the reading and they're helping us. Their uh, their production company, Floor One Productions, is helping us build some infrastructure on the film, and uh, they're also um, ading for me. So, um, so anyway, it was cool because uh, literally a year ago we began the journey, and now we're here. I love that there's almost no uh, form of media that exists anymore because of so many different variables that exist that allows you to be not. A multi potential, right? like you almost have to be like you coming from the tech space is probably going to be someday, like ten years from now, you're like, oh fuck, this thing that I picked up be. that has been I foundation. See that? I'm sure. It's yeah, crazy. I actually really do. It's it's funny. I I there I, I, there's no right way to to go about your life. Like there's no wrong path, and yeah. that's something that took me. I felt like I wasted five years. Mm. I, when I went back to it, I had so much to catch up on, yeah. but b everything that we're doing, it really is so relatable. Mm -hmm. It's everything well, it happens for a reason. You learn so much. There's something about the cycling aspect of like jumping into something and then taking some time away from it and really kind yeah. of passively yeah. letting that shit absorb. Yeah. Um, that Jeff Tweedy book that's up on the shelf there, uh, How to Write One Song. That oh is gosh, like you need to read all of these books. Yeah. I, and I picked them for a good reason. Like some of them are <laughs> they came they came in for like different <laughs> periods of my life. This is my, my buddy Alex wrote this book, uh, mm. How to Be a Rockstar. Uh, a friend of mine I used to tour manage and do merch for his band and they, you know, world tours all over the place. And wow. so like a lot of his experiences are baked into that book. And mm. and so I, I I think that when you kind of are getting into anything that is in the creative space, you're kind of there's always inevitably sort of this like roadblock moment that can kind of hold you up or like just, it can kill the dream. Like if you're just having enough trouble and the, the person's not there to help you, just your head was already above water, but you needed like that extra inch or two to keep your ears out so you could like hear what's around. Mm -hmm. Like there's just so many different nuanced aspects to how much the creative space doesn't allow you to be anything but more than one thing. Mm -hmm. You have to do a bunch of different things. Yeah. You, like you have yeah. to act, you're doing production, you're screenwriting, you're doing, yeah. a, we're wearing a bunch of different hats in that space yeah. and so, you know, Which is just, scary at first. Yeah, but from from one to another, like you guys are clearly doing it. You're out here, you're traveling around, you're doing film festival circuits. Like this is a thing that I don't know how the art of cinema is doing in Western culture at the independent level outside of what you see at some of the larger festivals. Yeah. And so when I see things that are being done locally, it's like this is a far cry from Cannes or the Sundance. But yeah. it's it's a start. Well, I think the cool part about what I've realized about Center Film Festival, granted, like I'm about to step into the first space <laughs> in an hour or two that I've been in through the festival, but I've been um, deep diving into the programming and uh, Fever premiered at um, BFI Flare, which is the British Film Institute's queer film festival. and then Which is like actually big. <laughs> we, yeah, yeah, which is huge. a massive festival. Huge. And, then I, and I didn't know, like as an American, I was like, one of our producers from Fever was like, you should submit to this. And I kind of just did it and forgot about it. And right, right. Yeah, got the email. I was like, guys, they got, they got accepted into this thing in London if you want to come. And they're like, yeah, we have to go to that. So yeah, I need to go to London, and, actually. Um, it wasn't until I got there. It actually wasn't until like a year after doing the rest of our circuit that I realized how big it was that we premiered there. But my point is that there are films in this festival that premiered there at the, at the BFI this year. And there are films like um, Fancy Dance that premiered at Sundance this year mm -hmm. that we did not, didn't get to see at Sundance, but we were there and witnessed sort of the beginnings of that journey with that film. And other films that we, you know, share mutual contacts on the producing teams sure. for. And and other, there's another film um, that is made by some New York theater actors who became directors and writers. And so uh, it's, not as isolated, I think, as one might assume. And yeah. I think that it's cool to notice that the community that's coming here to share their work. I mean, it's a testament to the programming team because I think they really did reach out and ask themselves questions about what's the moment in terms of what stories need to be told. Right. And there's a huge push for indigenous stories and a huge push for yeah. queer stories at this festival. I can't that think of the name the of local. it. Uh, 
Taika Waititi produced something on Hulu, of, uh, and it's about a, basically mm-hmm. like a Native Americans that are living on like reservation land. Yeah. I think it might be called Reservation Dogs, actually, is what it's yeah, called. Yeah. So good. I did not expect to love it as much as that. Because, like, it's yeah. hard sometimes to tell an indigenous story, I think, and do it in a way that feels authentic to people that aren't involved with the culture already. Yeah. And then and, and then for the casual viewer to see if this is a show they want to, like, yep. pick up. Yep. And But I think what you're getting at that I, that I do agree with is that part of what makes Center Film Festival capable of being successful now and more successful in the future is that it is – sort of an inward looking set of programming and programmers that is designed almost to sort of foster community and culture. Yeah. And, it, and that's ultimately yeah. what it takes is this is like in the independent circuit, whether it's music or film or, you know, tattoo artistry, like the ability to foster the culture around you is directly proportional. And I would argue like tantamount to the degree that you're going to see any success in building something. Yeah. And it takes people being able to be like, you know, looking and saying, like, these are the stories that need to be told right now, certainly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But also, like, people being like, yeah, we're going to be involved even though this is, like, maybe they've never heard of Center Center Film Fest. Yeah. But, they're, you know, like you said, there's people coming from, like, all over to bring it here. Yeah. And when you think it's isolated, I think it feels isolated from the creator perspective, especially at the independent level. It certainly can. It doesn't necessarily have to. Yeah. But to see that it's really thriving. Like, I was really excited that, you know, I had Pablo as one of my last guests that I filmed back in August and we talked about, you know, bringing s- filming to the, this area. Like this mm. is a really beautiful area. Yeah. And I have a, a good friend of mine, Kenan in Denver does a lot of work and he's pitching a, a, a like a mini series for Netflix. And he wants to do it sort of around like the three mile Island Harrisburg, mm. like mm. uh fallout kind of style, not necessarily post-apocalyptic, but he has sort of like a, a stranger things meets X files kind of thing that's coming together. And it's, really interesting but he's like i need you to go around in pennsylvania and i need you to take like a bunch of photos of just yeah. city like yeah. townscapes yeah. of places yeah. so i can sort of build out the storyboard for this yeah. and mm-hmm. so when you realize that we're only like a few degrees of separation away from being able to really do more and and more wild and magical and fantastical and also like nuanced storytelling out yeah. of this area you see that there's a bright future ahead for film yeah oh yeah yeah i think the 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 challenging and I feel beautiful part of creating things here or paired with sharing work from outside here is that I think Central PA, in my experience of it, the like culture that I'm really hyper focused on that I grew up in, requires this. There's not a lot of representation of the reality of that space on mass media. right? Yeah, the way certainly. that I experienced Central Pennsylvania growing up, I don't think is accurately represented Mm-hmm. on mass media i think that no, the series all. that attempt to to represent appalachia mm-hmm. have this like buck tooth straw hat thing yeah. going on that and i'm related exists. we're from we the exist. area of bedford like yeah, yes certainly cans, but I hit for it's there but i think in a different way like i think there's this humanity around like yeah we're like Sure, we're we're ripping around in the mud on four wheelers, but like also because like like my grandpa has like this souped up like golf cart that he drives down to his brother's house to like drop off dinner every. Night. It's <laughs> it's just like that's weird from the outside, funny, but from the inside, like a practical way to oh, like go do this sure. thing. And so that's a, one small example of this uh, culture that I think is made fun of from the outside that doesn't get to represent its heart from the inside out. One, I think that's the, the that's one pillar. But the other pillar, I think, is a requirement to also be in conversation with the outside and consider yes. what's happening in the world around it to be able to understand the value for itself around what that heart can actually do for the world. Because I think that I, that's why I'm so moved by seeing indigenous stories and queer stories being told inside of this space, because while I'm sure that the 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 sort of like melting pot that is Penn State especially Certainly happy about creates it like a you know a different kind of culture than what's happening just outside of its Certainly borders. it's a blue county <laughs> surrounded by red counties exactly. Go 15 yeah. minutes in any direction and exactly. you're in cow country and mm-hmm. so you can imagine or I'm sure you've experienced the sort of like sound bites that go through Yo, one's head as a child here like hearing the sort of slurs and the like fear of other and the like bunk- bunkering down to protect our mm-hmm. cult, you know, us, oh, we, yeah. well, these people, those people with this, pe- you know, that, that happens. And so I think there's like a really stiff boundary that needs to be sort of like, that I think we've tried to attack that needs to be like, 
massage. massage. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And it's really hard to like give a massage to the person that wounded you. You know, it's really yeah. hard to be like, hey, you hurt me. And so I'm going to take you to the spa is scary. And I think that as a white person telling stories in New York City and internationally, I've realized that that's my response. For me, I think I've downloaded the responsibility of ambassadorship. Yeah. And even this like. Here's a mirror. Yeah, man. It's so like, you want to talk, like we can put the mirror down and like talk, but like also it's on you. And like, what's it mean to be like, well, but therapy. And there's so many. <laughs> yeah, well, but therapy. Because those. But go once a week though. <laughs> or or three. Yeah. If you have multiple, that's fine too. And like one time with your spouse and. Like, yeah. And Parents for sure. Drag them there. So anyway, there are 27 <laughs> like hour long conversations in that statement. But I, I think my point is that there's a. A representation thing that does need to happen for the people here in order to make them feel seen and appreciated. Listen, I love Happy Valley State College Center, Pennsylvania. This is home for me. I was born here in State College. Like I've traveled the world. I was fortunate enough to get out and see places that were not just my hometown. Yeah. But when my parents split and I was younger, I had a lisp. I was super into my feelings. Like I was the kid that my parents thought would never stop crying at one point. Mm -hmm. And so when you move to a bunch of different school districts, post like elementary school, middle school, mm -hmm. I got, I was mistaken for being gay for so long that I was like, I, it was like an ongoing joke to be like, oh yeah, like I, I totally get that all the time. Like it doesn't bother me that I'm slightly effeminate with like my gestures and mm -hmm. the way I speak. It, it turns out if you have a vocabulary, you're pretty likely to be confused for being like, especially yeah. in this area. Yeah. And, and so I definitely agree. I, my biggest gripe with this area is that you're right. That representation matters. But infrastructure also needs to be there to be able to present this yeah. stuff and yeah. be able to present mm -hmm. it in any of the formats. And so, like, it is really, really heartbreaking for me that this place always just perpetually seems to be like a decade behind the times. Yeah. I'm really thrilled that a film festival is in this area. Like, yeah. to me, that I, I don't think I ever thought I would see that, at least not to the degree that I see the success mm -hmm. that it's having. Mm -hmm. And, you know, case in point, there you know, there's grant infrastructure in place to be able to you know, fun projects being made in this yeah. area because they want it in this area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And somehow we're just like a few degrees of separation, maybe one degree of separation away from the right person who's got the ability, the finances and the uh, uh, wherewithal to see that this place needs more media infrastructure yeah. to be able to develop. Like I'm in Pablo and I are working on developing like sort of a media warehouse space. Uh, we would love to have it be like an, a filmmaker, a, a music maker, an artist retreat. Mm -hmm. that handles like everybody's need. Do you want a podcast? You have a podcast you want to show up and do here? Cool, you can do that. You want to do music? You can do that. You want to do short films? You can do that. You want to do commercial work? You can do that. Like there's a way to monetize it in this area. And somehow the rich old white dudes that have the money or the capability of spending this are like clutching their fucking pearls and yeah. not spending it. But and and mm -hmm. it's it's hurting the culture overall because it's forcing it to, it's doing, to, it's galvanizing. It's making it need to, go within and figure out like, okay, how can we do this grassroots on our own? You know, putting together a production of any kind at the independent level, I don't think anybody that's never done it can possibly understand the amount of like lack of roadmaps and hurdles that you're definitely yeah. going to go through. Yeah. And I, I just wish that we could like alleviate the pressure points that are being pressed right now with the, you know, sort of like the difficulty in, in creating in this space. Cause it's like, you can get away with pretty much anything without having to have permits here, which is great. Mm -hmm. But like, it, that's not going to help you put an entire production together when you're like, okay, but I can't find grips anywhere yeah. near here. I yeah. can't get anybody that's going to be able to show yeah. up and help out with like practical on set right. lighting or anything like that. And so yeah. until we sort of foster the infrastructure, it's going to be more difficult to have people that are able to kind of contribute in, in a meaningful way here. Yeah. And I mean, that's where I'm sure that like the center film festival feel, feels a lot of pressure to like carry a lot sure. of that on its shoulders being like, from what I can tell the largest festival in this immediate area. And, and they should, and they should. Right. And the, and my point then is like, and it is sort of institutions like that, that are responsible for figuring out how to not only grow like the festival and what seems to be the more like affluent area, as far as film goes in the epicenter of state college, but there is like, a requirement like you're saying to figure out how to use the people that are coming from the outside to like support and creating educational tendrils mm -hmm. to go out into the schools and that's exactly a perfect word that's exactly and, like, what, it what, is. Does it what does it mean to go to bedford county and what does it mean to go to blair county and what does it mean to go to these other places and go into a high school and drop in some infrastructure on a workshop and like get kids 
excited about understanding that they can make a career out of doing those technical things. Well, we kind of had like a, a beginning initial uh, kind of understanding of that maybe like a decade and a half ago when Denzel Washington and Chris Pimer in the area filming a show that, that was about a runaway train and they were mm -hmm. filming it in like the Altoona area. Mm -hmm. And so they, but they were staying at a Best Western that's like right next to uh, Premiere 12, which is where I used to go see all these movies. And I was like, I remember going to films during the, that filming period that the hotel wasn't open yet, yeah. but they were housing all the staff and the crew and everybody were there. And it was just easier to commute them the 45 minutes up 99 to Altoona. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember being like, damn, like, Star Trek, I think, it, like, they're rebooted, come out. So I'd seen Chris Pine and that, Denzel Washington, like, who doesn't know him. So I was like, damn, this is, like, right here. I grew up here. Like, this could happen here. And then it was, like, nothing at the major studio level again for, I don't, if, if ever since then, but certainly not in a long time since yeah. then. Mm. And so I think that this is, like, a good segue into that space. Is like, okay, well, now we've got the independent, independent film space, which some of my favorite films have been birthed out of that space. Yeah. Sure. We used to have the Garmin Opera House in Belfont. It was a, uh, an old, old vintage theater. And I, used to, I saw all the Lord of the Rings movies there. Mm -hmm. uh, camped out the night before to see them. And mm -hmm. then I saw movies like Adaptation, which was, uh, Nick, like— a really like okay. If anybody who's seen we were that, just that talking we about it last just, night. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's so weird. So funny. Yeah. Uh, but then uh, I saw I saw that I saw Amelie. I saw like just a bunch of like films that were not going to see the the major yeah. motion picture theaters in the area. Yeah. And I loved it. I was like, fuck. I w there should be one of these. And there are some of these in a lot of the towns, especially yeah. in our area. Yeah. But like. It's, it's almost like not enough to support the culture yeah. on its own. And it can't. It's Agreed. no man is an island. Like it Agreed. can't stand on its own pillar. But Well, that, I mean, right. That And that becomes a cultural issue that's like not actually fixable just from inside of a space like this either. There's like a how do you create a cultural interest in paying for those movies over Barbie and over, not to say that those movies aren't of course. culturally impactful, but there is a sort of focus on IP right of now mm -hmm. that gets pushed into the theaters yeah. because I know that if I went to the, I don't know what the Altoona theaters are. They were like Carmike cinemas when I grew up. I right. don't yeah, know yeah, if that yeah. exists yeah. anymore. That's where I saw Toy Story. So yeah, it's now an AMC or something. And I think like AMC is very aware of their audience in these rural spaces. And they know that like, we're going to pump the summer's rom-com and we're going to give them the Barbie and we're going to give yeah. them the action movie. Yep. And then like the indies are going to be left for, the theaters in the city and even the AMCs in New York city aren't necessarily showing things like an Amelie, you know, in that time, like the indie films, like I saw, well, I saw past lives at an AMC, but Did I think mm -hmm. Pablo, can you cut to the wide and go let pa or Pablo Carlos, can you cut to a wide and let Pablo in? Yeah. Um, Anyway, point being that even in please the city, and thank you for fucking listeners. Damn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now we need Pablo. <laughs> Call him by the wrong name. Yeah. Yeah. He was like, yeah. How do I appear quasi racist? We and love Carlos. Say, we just, love Carlos. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe we need to just like get honest about it and be like, look, there are microaggressions inside of all of us and we're sorry. It's so real. <laughs> That's a whole other freaking think cutting, conversation. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, think it's the one we're trying to have. I think like, yeah. I just, I met them both. I, I picked up Carlos as an intern <laughs> and then Pablo. It's like I, two people that are just in character are so totally different, but still both <laughs> interested in the film space. Yeah. So it's so fucking stupid how easy it is for me to say Pablo or Carlos. Yeah. And I, I, it's well, like I have yeah, children. I'm literally like, that. I'm multiple it's, switching yeah. between the two. Well, I'm not racist. No, well, ooh, yo, I mean, I think okay, like, this is actually a this really is what we have good to talk about. This is a <laughs> this good is what we have to talk about. Because listen, <laughs> Listen, okay, rewinding a little bit, I come also from a very conservative place. I, I grew up on Long Island. It feels very close to New York City. It feels very close to a metropolitan area, but it is incredibly red. It is con incredibly sure. conservative, yep. incredibly white. And again, I grew up I, I not only seeing the people who looked and thought like my family. And so I, and then I went to school in Maine. <laughs> right, right, right. And then yeah. I lived in Boston. Yeah. So, and then I came to New York and was like, whoa, mm -hmm. yeah. this is not how mm -hmm. this is. This the world is so much bigger. Yeah. But the thing is, this is why I get, went on Beanie because, well, not well, this is the why, but it's why I feel so connected to the story because I also, as a storyteller, want to be talking to the people that I love and the people who I grew up with. Right. And it's like that mirror. Like you can't ignore the fact that 
you have grown up thinking these things or thinking these ways saying, you know, I'm not racist. It's like, I've, I feel like I'm coming more to terms with, yeah, like you have to be honest with yourself yeah. and it doesn't make you, it doesn't, it doesn't make you a bad person. It doesn't, you know, I think it's, it's, there's a lot to like really step into your whiteness and mm -hmm. it's a responsibility to be like, Frick. Yeah, I mean, nice like we're person. we're ultimately going to be the ones that shift the the perspective on how. I mean, like like again, we're, just like in politics, we're like a few old white people dying off away yeah. from like some real like transformative change happening yeah, on the government level. But I mean, there yeah. there is sort of like a you, with regards to I guess like racism in general. Like you really it is obviously so obviously born out of ignorance because like once you meet anybody that is of a different culture than you, period regardless of race, culture, just at the cultural level. Right. Yeah. You can be totally impacted and transformationally changed by your experiences. I, I had a, a really good friend, Jerome. He was my first black friend in my grandparents' uh, like apartment complex they lived in. And his mom was a single mom. He had several brothers. They all watched horror movies, and I was petrified. And I remember them making me watch the uh, Tim Curry version of It <laughs> oh for the first God. time. Yeah. And I will never forget him or his family for the rest of my life because I didn't shit with the fucking shirt, the shower curtain not being wide open for like 12 years subsequently after that. <laughs> and, but other, but I know him as my friend that we went to the swimming pool every day with. Yeah. Like yeah. we bought, we had a uh, goggle. So we were like the two kids that were yeah. just like underneath the pool, just like yeah. lurking like guppies at the bottom. Yeah. But like, before we dive into that whole fucking conversation, I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't start talking about Beanie a little bit. I wanted to have you kind of like walk me through a little bit about the the plot and the details because you kind of loosely touched on it, yeah, but we haven't really yeah. gotten the chance to like talk about it. Yeah. I mean, I think. This is this your baby? Is this your magnum opus? Oh, it's his It baby. may. It may be. It, it was. <laughs> it accidentally mm -hmm. became that. Um, it started as a short that uh, was primarily about my grandma and I in the 90s, chasing Beanie Babies during the craze that was that Beanie Bubble. Um, I worked at McDonald's part-time as oh, like a 16 year old at the time, yes. so I was like so you were aware. right in the yes. fucking dick of it, it, man. Yeah. You had that. like moms going, can I buy the uh, the panda? You're like, what? Is Good morning. A You're welcome yeah, to your yeah. Beanie. Right. I think like it started as this sort of romp that was like an appreciation of the way that my grandma created a safe dream space for me as a kid inside of a really conservative home culture that sort of pressured me to either become a man or like be oh, yeah. people pleasy to someone else's feelings in order to be safe and get what I needed. And yeah. my grandma was a bit more like, what's the game of the day? Like, let's go yeah, play. For sure. Or like, also, if you don't want to do that, like you can just sit there while I like put laundry on the line and those peaceful moments and then those playful moments, I didn't realize until I grew up were so formative in my yeah. ability to like actually love myself and actually like give myself that space to play and consider who I am in quiet moments today. And so that was the beginning of Beanie. But now, over time, as it's developed and as we've had opportunities to think about it in a larger way, I've begun writing a feature that we're reading pages of today that's heading toward a, a first full draft that um, continues to use that storyline as its backbone and ends up in some farcical sort of Mm -hmm. extreme moments um around like a hijacked delivery truck and um the grandma character experiencing the onset of her early onset alzheimer's and how that impacts that romp and but now there are two additional storylines that kind of showcase how in the 60s my grandma's formative experiences in marrying my grandpa and taking a stint in california attempting to be an actress in this film and the seeming failure of that impacted how she raised her kids and built that mm -hmm. family structure that and my it, child arrived within. Right. And then it also showcases a present day arc of my current self experiencing attempting to be an artist or being an artist. But, you know, the guy, that character feeling like they're attempting to be an artist and attempting to love and attempting to build relationship romantically and how those family structures impacted the way that I show up in love today, which is a very active conversation for me as a human being separate from my work. And so in that way, yeah, but it's going to infiltrate into your work, right? right? Like it's that's a right. part of the dogma of you. So that's like, right. it's going to be hard to 
escape it not that you would want to right like i feel that's like right. it, yeah. it being there is the exact reason you're able to kind of put pen to paper and create something yeah. that's going to be a genuinely a representative story yeah. for like you said people in this not necessarily specifically people in this area that need that representation yeah. but also like your transformative experiences are probably parallel or akin to a lot of other people's experiences that, mm -hmm. yeah and it's yeah. that that's why representation matters when it's unspoken you feel like you it's never you're not seeing you in it's hard to yeah. watch you know I, I love marvel movies it's hard to go to a marvel movie and feel like i'm so close to being like tony stark so like i yeah. i there's a big disconnect yeah. there yeah but i can watch some of the imperfections in the characters and be like that yeah that line or that something was born from a real place and yeah. that is i like that yeah yeah there's a universality to specificity that i mm. think is alive <laughs> in this film um and I do also think it's very much for people from this area or people from areas like this. And this is um, 100%. This is one of thousands, hundreds of thousands of cities, towns across the country. Yeah. I mean, the world. Like, I think that if yeah, there's anything yeah, yeah. I've learned, it's that, like, the things that we fight against as, or speak for myself, the things that I fight, come up against as a queer person from a rural area like this. It, is that struggle or that experience is mirrored in folks that come from rural areas in France and in the folks that come from rural areas in West Africa. And of course, whiteness and the privilege that comes from that is a very specific part of this story. But I think the experience of I grew up inside of a microcosm that reverberates against itself and, mm. and it becomes an echo chamber of, of an sure. idea. Step. What does it mean to be the person that stepped outside of that echo chamber and is therefore an oddity in the rest of the world? Yeah. Especially metropolitan areas. But then in getting that city dweller life and becoming the city slicker, how are you then othered by returning back home? Yeah. Yes. And kind of mirroring back to you the sense of being othered from the get-go and knowing as a kid that like I'm different but I don't know why and no one's telling me why but I'm like bad and why am I bad maybe I can help you no it's not working because it feels special but I guess it's wrong I don't like, yeah there's a lot of weird internal questions and, and situations yeah. you kind of go through in that space certainly but I think you know what like we have to have like this has to become a 10 episode series to touch on all of these <laughs> things but I think I'm at a place where I'm realizing that like the special versus bad special versus wrong dynamic inside of queerness um and otherness in general i think the same could be applied to race and the same to be applied to ableness or, or lack thereof like i or di a differently abledness like i i'm realizing that even special is dangerous is what i'm saying that yeah like, yeah yeah the idea that like naming a queer kid as special is is isolating them from the opportunity to receive the support that normal people receive right and so i remember as a kid I'm, I'm working through my own like journey with like neurodivergence and what it means to like recognize what my brain might have been doing as a kid. Oh, yeah. You and too. <laughs> I ended up skipping a grade. I skipped second grade. And did so, you really? Yeah. And so I was like I a gifted that. kid. I thought that was made up. I thought nobody actually did that. I skipped second, second grade. grade too? That's, I, I mean, did like a week and my handwriting is not really bad and I blame it on not doing handwriting class in second grade. <laughs> but that's a different conversation. But I think <laughs> skipping that class. I only type scripts. <laughs> or grade kind of like paralleled with this queer coming of age experience in that I was just like isolated and in a very small class of I had like a hundred people in my graduating class. And so there were like three of us in this gifted program. Yeah. And so it's like, you're, you're taken out of the group and put into this like little room with three people that are like doing puzzles while everyone else is doing math class. And then you're expected to just like go to lunch with the rest of them. Right. And also like be a little effeminate and a little like, nerdy and a little bit like i like pokemon while you're playing football and i think like which was not cool back in the day for people that don't and now know pokemon's so cool yeah yeah yeah, yeah that's cool. very frustrating <laughs> it is frustrating <laughs> yeah fucking tell me about it it is frustrating so let's get into the creative team side of things sure. a little bit like you're obviously a part of this as well so like where did you kind of step in do you feel like from the beginning from its birth well maybe a little bit after its birth yeah. but um, yeah, I mean, this is the, that's what this project is so special to me, uh, specifically as it pertains to um, my relationship with Jeremy, our relationship. <laughs> um, I mean, we it's incredibly special for me to be part of it because I've, you know, especially being here too in Pennsylvania and really like getting to know the the place that he's 
spoken so much about. Um, have you come here before? I've never been to Pennsylvania. This is so cool. I'm so, so glad to like have met. This is like a treat. You know this is, is a treat, right? I am yeah. so, so, and I've been saying this nonstop. I am so happy to be here. I've cried so many times. <laughs> I it, it just means a lot. We're going to be spending a lot of time with his family. I play uh, the mother in the film. Okay. Um, the young boy's mom. So, you know, being able, I mean, I know his mom via FaceTime and text, but being able to like be in the house and spend time with her in person. It's like practical is, research. I mean, practical research, yes, but also like, I mean, Jeremy has spent a lot of time with my family. He knows, I mean, my dad texted him yesterday. <laughs> um, <laughs> You're on that level. No, okay. he's, yeah, he's very, too. I mean, he's really infiltrated my family um, in the best way. Maybe, the use best like way. A different, <laughs> maybe use a different word. I don't, I'll take it. It might be able to. No, I, I, I don't it's, think it's, it's a different co-opted. word. I think it it's exactly that word. Um, my point being, we've just, uh, I mean, he is more than my best friend. He's mm. like, you know, we are, we are. A weed. A, a, yeah. <laughs> it's a problem. Um, but a, a, that's why I think this project is so special. And, and I mean, it meant a lot for him to ask me to be part of it mm. because you can feel you, you, I mean, Reading the script, I mean, you feel the heart. And I mean, I've read his writing before and he's just, you know, I say this all the time, but he is in someone that I want in my life as a human being. But when you find these people that can move you so deeply mm-hmm. as a, as another artist, yeah, it is, it is honestly, it is really hard to find someone whose work touches the inside of your body in such a way. And I, after reading his words, I mean, I, I knew that I wanted to, to be part of anything that he does, but specifically it meant a lot to be part of this story that's so close to him and that he's grown so much as a human being while writing this specific story. And I feel like both of us have gone through such growth as human (laughs) beings and separately, individually, together in our relationship with the story. And it's just been, it's been a spiritual experience, to yeah. be honest, um, going through, going through this in the past year. And so, yes, that's my, that's my connection to it. I'm a producer on the film. I'm acting in it and I'm so grateful. We, we, yeah. I, you I, realize that this is lightning in a bottle, I think, in hindsight, over time, like you said, like when you when you kind of look back and you're like, damn, this is like a really big pivotal moment in my life. Sure. Like th- that's testament to the fact that you can collaborate with people on a lot of different types of projects. Mm-hmm. That does not mean that the collaborative process is always a very synergistic kind of uh, atmosphere or environment. Mm-hmm. So do you feel like this has been a collaborative process in like the, the culminating of putting this well, like today we're doing like just a, a, like what, 25 pages of the, mm-hmm. of the script. Mm-hmm. And I've never written 25 pages of any script in my life. And I might I be able to if chat GPT helps me out and I do some severe. Just put it out. I said it out loud. <laughs> I said it out loud. <laughs> said, listen, listen. Cut that. No. C- Cavemen were Actually, probably no, no, pretty pissed when world. paintbrushes came around and we weren't doing shit yeah. with our fingers anymore. So like I mean, this is a new tool in the, the this tool bag. This is such another. Yeah. You know, like, Not to get out of the capital, but what no. I'm saying is, what I'm saying is. <laughs> Sweating. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can't be cut. Yeah. Uh, um, I like, know. Like I'm, I'm somehow sweating. But in the collaborative process <laughs> you guys have endured, what have you really kind of seen sort of like bring value to the, this, you know, production? Um, I think for me, I mean, Fever was my first foray into film in uh, any kind of like financed, fully staffed way. And I learned that I guess specifically from the like development stage and the creative writing stage collaboration is so important from just like an idea generation standpoint yeah. and realizing that writing is not a solo journey. At least the no. good writing is well, mm-hmm. from what I experience as good writing, there's like a truth telling aspect to it that makes things work well uh, and touch people that universality comes from truth telling. And I think that you can't yeah. tell the truth without bouncing it off of other humans to make sure it's the truth you know right right, because right i think the first draft 
can be about like telling my truth, healing my wound. What is my feeling? <laughs> yeah, yeah, get it and out. And then it's like, <laughs> it's not fun to just watch your like narcissistic like representation of what your mom did to you. Yeah, go to therapy. Like, <laughs> yeah. we don't care. And I, you're 30, like figure your shit out. And so I think that there's a requirement to bounce those things off of other people to be like, what's your experience of this topic? And maybe not your experience. You can't know what happened between me and my mom, but you can know about like what happens between children and moms. Yeah. And you can know like how human beings talk about these topics inside of these worlds. And so my point is that I've learned it's really important that if I feel really precious about something, that it's time to like kill my darlings and like send it into the, I say it all the my time. network kill and be babies. like, tell me the, tell me the truth. Like what, like fuck the structure and like good writing. Like, is this true? Like, is this honest? Like, right. What's it moving in you? And I, and like, therefore, like, what do you vibrate with or not? Or like, what's this bringing up for you? And I think that I was shy about that in the beginning because I thought it made me not a good writer to not be able to reach that by myself. But I think I've realized now, point being that inside of each of the projects that I'm working on, it, it is important to me to make sure that the collaborators that are on it, even from a production space, especially the actors, especially the cinematographer, get a say on like, what's this world and what's it doing and what's it doing well and what's it not doing well and how is that not doing well actually part of the good thing and, and like figuring out together the story that we jointly want to tell because i think that that sure the final product is impacted inside of that but especially like the collaboration along the way and the, where we're at right now is the beginning of what's going to be a three-year journey at least by the time the thing right. reaches distribution right and so it's like you have to want to be a part of something and feel like your hand is in the heartbeat of it mm -hmm. to want to be there for that long. I would liken this to songwriting in that I feel like as a musician, when we finish a song and we release it, I know what I was thinking about when I wrote it, where I was when I wrote the first couple mm -hmm. lines of the song, what it meant to me, how I want people to perceive it. But the minute I release a song, it really is no longer mine because I mean, I've misheard lyrics in my life and thought sure. a song was about one thing and it was totally about something else. Yeah. And that is, that's like an oversimplification of what happens yeah. here. But I would imagine that the initial story writing process for you to get this out is akin to, I released the song to, instead of like, you know, you're, you're not your tester audience, but like the people you're going to collaborate with is yeah. to ask, is this true? Is this authentic? Is this like the most accurate yeah. representation of the story I'm trying to tell yeah. right now? But when you put pitch it to the group and it becomes this collaborative, like co-opted creative endeavor, the thing that you kind of run into is that it becomes everybody's film. So like mm -hmm. you said, you have the right DP, the right cinematographer, and he just has like an, uh, I, there's so much she. nuance. Mm -hmm. at, what's his name? She. She. Uh, she? Yeah. What's her name? Sorry. I, uh, so no, sorry. Okay. Well, no, no, no. It's okay. Yeah. Well, but even better, yeah. right? Like, yeah. so that's the best thing about it is that you're getting different, like, gendered, cultured, mm -hmm. relational mm -hmm. experiences mm -hmm. that are interjecting mm -hmm. into this. And so, like, the, when it becomes the groups mm -hmm. and everybody's contributing to it. Now is where it starts. It's like it gets an extra release to become the next yeah. incarnation or evolution of what yeah. it's going to be. Yeah, I think just like using the music analogy, I imagine it being like the part of the thing where like you bring the lyrics, you bring that first lick into the room and then the band figures out together, like what's the bass line? And then yeah. the drummers are, yeah, that's the, and I think that can't <laughs> come from are you manipulation. Beatles, are you a Beatles fan by chance? I mean, I sure. Feel in, like in that everybody really? is. Yeah, right, right, right. In the way be. that everyone in the world likes the best Get Back band, on you know? HBO is like a yeah. really brilliant, I think, visual representation of storytelling that does a good job of showing what music making was like yeah. for them in mm -hmm. that era. And mm -hmm. I like you literally see basically exactly what you said in real time yeah. of it developing. I'm really inspired by um, a group called Bon Iver who, yeah. who uh, kind of create in that sort of collaborative way. Mm -hmm. I know yeah. Justin, the leader of that troop, troop, <laughs> uh, we go by many names, worked on <laughs> their album, I comma I with a group of like collegiate dancers in like a master's program in like the Midwest. I think he's, I think it might've been in Minnesota where he's from or somewhere in middle America. And as he was writing, he would bring like parts of songs to the dancers who would like move to the music and he would witness what that inspired in them and then take that movement back to the room and to the studio and incorporate what he got from that into the music and it became this multimedia show that they ended up touring with with the dancers and it became the sort of like 
live mixing and movement experience. But the thing I'm most inspired by is just the way that like collaboration across medium can really change the way that the brain and like the spirit kind of experiences what was on the page to begin with. And I think that that's what I love about theater. And like, that's why I'm grateful that I have this theater relationship too, because I think that that really impacts the way that I write and the way that I collaborate and the way that I Certainly. operate on set mm -hmm. and the way that I imagine like camera movement. And like, I love big long one takes for the mm -hmm. like opportunity to like, rehearse and like create the Block theater out. of the moment. And yeah, like, for what? sure. Yeah, it's exactly what it is. It's funny that you say that because I, I think that one take videos, I think it's almost statistically and overwhelmingly perform way better on yeah. YouTube for things just because I think people are interested in like the, wow, this is probably really so difficult live. to execute this. Yeah. Look at any OK Go video where they have a live one take of a, a already overwhelming mm -hmm. amount of things taking mm -hmm. place. Like that's the entire premise of the show. You just basically summed it up mm -hmm. was that the acknowledgement that collaboration happens across industries and yeah. that that cross pollination is really ultimately like yeah. one of the best forms of a developmental tool that you can kind of integrate into your system. And, and the more yeah. information you can feed that, the more you can kind of weed out what you don't want. I would rather have the surplus of information and kind of sculpt yeah. than have to like say, okay, this is the slab of stone I have. I have to carve my movie out of this. Yeah. I mean, I think what you're talking about now reminds me of the beginning of the conversation when you were talking about being multi-hyphenates and like this sense yeah. of being required to be that. And I think I'm really in process with that right now because I felt this feeling of like needing to like build the house that I'm living in on every project and like feeling some frustration around that on my journey. Right. And Forcing like, a square peg in a round hole. Like this is how yeah, it has to be. And then if it yeah. can't be, you're like, uh. yeah. And I think like there's, but at this point, as I'm trying to like step away from like doing everything on every project and <laughs> get into like holding boundaries for myself around like I am focusing on the creative and attracting teams that will help me to execute that I you know will always be like a producing hand in but trying to really get back to the creative I'm realizing that there is a bit of like trust required yeah <laughs> to like decide to be one thing and like there's that trust in one's one thing, and maybe not for the rest of time, but like one thing at a time, is the only way to actually find that collaboration across industry or across medium or across role. You have to sort of trust that like, I have to get out of somebody else's way so they can step into this role. Certainly, and out of your own way to yeah. the other degree. Cause like yeah. some of that roadblocking and building your own house will do that. It'll yeah. basically, it'll shut out the wrong people at the right time yeah. when you need them. Hey, like, yeah, I'm a contractor. Like, I can build the house for you. Like, no, like, I've got it. I <laughs> yeah. know what I want it to be. You won't do it right. And right. then the guy's like, well, I kind of, sorry, I can do it. if you No. I can actually even do it faster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, that ego has to go away. So It's definitely a very important part of the process. Um, so as you're moving forward with production and, you're, and things are, like, starting to finalize, is the script, like, where do you think percentage-wise you guys are? 50 that that's listen fifty percent because of I, the feature I, of the feature of the feature aspect. Yeah. I'd say it's somewhere around like fifty pages written, and I ultimately would love for it to land around the one fifteen mark. Realistically, it'll probably be longer than that, just because there's so much narrative real estate that needs to be fit onto the page. But uh, yeah, I just I'd call it fifty percent complete. Yeah, yeah, you're on the way. Yeah, listen, on the, also on the way maybe is a better way to. I, I wanted to touch on. Um, Annie Golden and like her involvement in the film and like where that where that kind of stems from. We only have like obviously like a few minutes left if we got to yeah. be there by 945. It's only a five minute walk, so we, we can go a few minutes over. But like Perfect. I did okay. want to kind of dig into that a little bit. I was hoping she was going to need to be here. Obviously, she wasn't able to because the SAG. Oh, so like, yeah. Um, the strikes, which we stand in solidarity. Um, but yeah, so Annie came on to the project what, a couple of months ago now. Um, we feel so lucky that she that she's a part of it. And also she, oh, thanks to our, also thanks, shout out to our casting director, um, Walter, Walter Ware. Ware. <laughs> the way we said that was very funny. Say it in time. Um, <laughs> Walter Ware, Walter yeah. Ware. She, she joined and she threw herself into the world mm -hmm. and the story and into us. And we, 
it's been so, it's been such an integral part of the creative process, being able to sit with her and have these long conversations about, you know, specifically Jeremy and Annie about, you know, his family and growing up and his relationship to his grandmother. And she was able to speak to her own experiences and, and what she can bring. She's got such a robust life. It, like, well, she's, she's done so much. She's that, a like, rock star, quite for literally. Sure. literally. And, literally yeah. <laughs> and because of that, we are experimenting. I don't know if it's officially in the pages, but, um, you know, working on... Well, Jeremy's, <laughs> Jeremy's degree is in classical piano. And so he... Um, he because of this thing that he shares with Annie thought of uh, creating a song uh, that he writes with his grandmother and uh, that being the most Especially motif, on the piano, what an intimate, like... It's just such a beautiful thing and we're working uh, with a, oh, oh my gosh, a very talented composer, Brooke Monroe, who worked on Fever. And um, he is really excited to work with the team on building this original music. Um, and mm -hmm. so it being this beautiful piece, but also a little bit of rock and roll. Um, so we're really excited to bring that in and that would not have happened happened without Annie. That's that's mm -hmm. that's a very Annie golden mm -hmm. thing that we get to have mm -hmm. now in this project yeah. that, and and something that we get to share with her, yeah. um, which is quite beautiful. Um, and she's just been such a lovely human being to have uh, part of the team. She just loves to she loves to be there for mm -hmm. us. You know, he she for Jeremy's birthday, she came to Jeremy's birthday party um, and it, it, she got him a little lobster beanie baby, you know, at, for yeah. his birthday Hilarious. and with other yeah. things. It was sweet. It was, yeah, it's very special. You can, yeah. I'll let you speak to No, him. that's, yeah. I mean, I think logistically, to fill in the gaps, we we did bring Annie on via the cast, like a pretty traditional casting process. Um, we offered her the role via our casting director, Walter Ware. And, um, but as Colette said, I think a big part of being inspired to offer it to Annie was this like connection to music. And mm. even though the, when that choice occurred to us, I don't think the film had much of like a verbal recognition of like mus music being a part of it outside of like knowing we wanted to have a great score. Um, but then when we were looking through Annie's past work, it actually was when I watched this video of <laughs> Annie singing um, the worst pies in London from Sweeney Todd yeah. and she was singing and while like Beanie by no means is going to sing in that way in the film there was this heart that came to it from this small woman you know there's this big energy and I think that that's what I loved that connected with the way I remember my grandma my grandma is currently in a nursing home with late stage dementia and she's fairly catatonic and doesn't remember us and fairly bedridden and very bedridden and so there's this um energy that I remember from my grandma that was like sort of smallish sweet woman that also when the time is right whether it be in celebration or like pranks or like the goof mm -hmm. of it all but also like when standing up for people she there's this energy that comes out of her that yeah folks just know not to fuck with her and I think that it's palpable for that's, yeah, that's what awesome Annie carries too is this mm -hmm. sort of like yeah, yeah it's love until like but like also don't fuck with me or the people I love. Right. And so that said, I think just for everyone's clarity, like that's why Annie's not here because she's um, actively striking with the, the actors union with SAG and Annie's on the picket lines every day and mm -hmm. there are photos of her circulating, just kind of leading the way. And it's really cool to be working with someone that carries such, like you said, a robust history with the industry from music to theater to film. Uh, and now is such an active participant in the moment that we're in. And, and so an advocate, yeah. we're excited yeah. to see what will come as hopefully that comes to a close this week and Annie can jump back into work with us on this. Yeah, I mean, she's certainly at the stage of her career where the projects she takes on are probably projects she can really get a vibe for. And so like the fact that this probably spoke to her to some degree yeah. Yeah. before like meeting you guys and really getting yeah. involved yeah. Is, is probably really a, a special feeling for, for you, certainly. Yeah. But like yeah. Yeah. in general, it's really cool to know that like somebody who's got that, not necessarily, I don't want to say clout as in like the way she can like throw her weight around and get what she wants, but like in that she has this entire realm of experience yeah. and she still is looking at this and being like, yeah, this is, 
This yeah. Is, this is it right here. Yeah, I think like, man, I'm in mm. a real deep process with right now with like where I place the value of visibility or the value of like resume over a human, you know, and like where the right. industry can ask us to do that sometimes. And I think that like, let's not dance around the thing when we were trying to offer the rule to someone we wanted someone with some level of visibility that carried certainly some value and but, that's just good strategy there's a, i don't yeah, think anyone would fight for that but i think the thing i'm trying to critique in this moment just maybe outside of this pocket just in myself as a filmmaker is i learned that annie is so much more than her resume and like what one might think that she is just based on her visibility on the shows she's been on and her experience as a an actor there's yeah, like a certainly. human there that is so alive and important and like the paper is like, gonna be so much more different than the also person small, you know mm. what i mean and also like quiet and also just like has a family with their own struggles and like it has a reminded me that i love i'm so grateful to be working with annie and like as i'm fo zooming out and thinking about the rest of the ensemble and working on projects moving forward I'm learning to also like put a priority on voices that like deserve to be heard and prioritized in that way that don't have that resume yet. Because there's so many artists that are overlooked because they don't have something flashy to throw in right. the PR of it all. Right. And I think that there are other ways. Some of my favorite films. That's going to change. Series, Our generation coming up making film is going to change yeah, that aspect of yeah. things. Because that is very much so like an almost an industry baked in trade. Yeah. To like is, find it, your anchor actor right. and, and like build your. Enough people are going to eventually have developed through like, you know, the YouTube space and beyond. Yeah. That like you're going to start to see that that shift into the back burner a little bit and and rightfully so it should yeah. i think it, it's going to get us more towards the getting the genuine talent versus the resume over there yeah. like and not to say folks with resumes don't have genuine talent yeah Obviously no no they do but right. i think there's like it's a representation thing too though like if you can get actors that are not that, as named don't have those that, flashy bells and that, whistles on their resume that can showcase like what they do i mean every actor that's the ultimate dream i think of any actor is to like be seen for something you've done that you poured yourself into that yeah, I mean, it's all that endeavor. Yeah. Certainly you love the craft, but eventually, like if you're trying to do it as a career, you're like, this has got to pay bills. Like I want to be yeah. able to, to do this. So like to get seen and recognized and picked up in a film where your talent is recognized yeah. and, and, and yeah. displayed gives you the opportunity to kind of jump on the other side of that fence and make that happen. And I wonder how we can, as an industry, like substitute the word visibility for impact, you know, and yeah. like, consider how, but being an impactful artist actually is the calling card over the visibility or the face recognition. Yeah. Like we've spent a lot of time recently, the last couple of days, really like gassing over some actors that like don't have social media and aren't necessarily like sexualized in the media either. And right. the, surely that's a strategy for some of those actors. Specifically, we were like thinking about Mahershala Ali because we just watched um, The Bear. No, uh, Rami. I mean, Rami, sorry. Oh, Rami and the Bear share so many things. Yeah. Rami being one of those things. But we watched Rami and and he's such a huge part of the second season. And we were just thinking about the way that like Mahershala's work just like carries this weight inside of that show that doesn't have to be loud or flashy. And like the show wasn't like with Mahershala Ali. Like he wasn't, maybe he was on a poster somewhere, but I don't think they were like using him as like Moonlight's Mahershala Ali in, in Rami. He just like did this impactful performance that was like, the show wouldn't have been the same without him. Mm -hmm. And I think that if you, Mahershala is not on social media and the marketing of his art is not necessarily. Which is crazy because he's, he's about to be like the next Blade. And yeah. Also yeah. like he's about to have a huge career jump in terms of like, you know, like the resume monetary value yeah. that he'll be able to get for the upcoming films. But yeah. as an actor, he's brilliant. Like yeah. we're watching like the underpinnings and makings of this guy. And he's already great, but like he's only going to get better. Like I he, think, yeah. Also the point is like, you can see his spirit through hmm. the screen. Like yeah. You, I don't know if you've seen this specific performance. I haven't. I, I highly recommend. I've, I've never really seen anything quite like it. That it's kind of like what I spoke to before about something that like actually kind of touches me inside. Um, it's, it's, you can see who he is as a human being. Mm -hmm. You can see the the weight that he carries is this this truthfulness, this intentionality, this specific specificity mm. um, that you can you can see how he moves through the world. Yeah. Um, 
and something that we we've spoken as Jeremy said we've spoken a lot about recently like you know obviously yeah we want to make money yeah we want to pay our bills yeah we want to do this for a living but also what is the point of what we're doing yes why are we doing this if you don't have an answer you're you yeah. you you need to you need to you need to know yeah we we would rather spend our time in our little cabin in Pennsylvania yeah. You know, working on our note cards and and you know watching these really impactful performances and meeting these human beings that we connect with so deeply, and work with those people and create things with these people, then researching on Instagram who has the most followers, yep. who's right, who you know who's hot right now, who's sexy, who brings this. Like I, I'm going through a, a lot of you know a, a kind of pivotal moment in as an actor as a producer as a filmmaker as a storyteller like what what the fuck do i want to say yeah yeah and I, who do i want to say like who do i want in my circle that i feel so connected to because this industry can get scary this like if you're not certainly. if you're not operating in a really mindful grounded truthful way it's so easy to get caught up in in these yeah. things that don't actually matter but i think I'm trying also so hard to focus on the positive reality that there are people out there that are doing that and like wondering sure. how to like name the same thing you said, but say, go where it feels good. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And like, I think at the end of the day, it is incumbent on the individual, the artist to be able to go inward and be able to outline their calling, outline the, the their tribe and say like these are the people that i i see in my camp now i know where my my tribe has room to improve and grow yeah. like it's very important to kind of be able to self-assess and say this is this is who i am this is this is what my mm -hmm. art is there's what i want my art to be and then there's mm -hmm. how it ends up sometimes yeah. sure there's it's you know you're it's it's a constantly evolving journey. So you're never like, I mean, just for me, I know we got to wrap up. We have like all of two or three minutes left, but like as, from, as a multi-potential like myself, like do, being a musician, being a, you know, a director, a producer, an editor, uh, I've already won an Emmy. And so now I want to go for a Grammy and then okay. I want to act. Okay. Like I, I want to break into acting. That's why I, he offered me oh the opportunity gosh, to do this John. today. So I was like, I was like, yeah, I'll do a script read. I was like, I've awesome. never done one. Let's, <gasps> let's go for it. But yeah. like I did theater in high school and mm -hmm. I, it's just something that I, I, I wanted to do it all. You realize there's, you can't do it all at the same time. At the same time. Mm -hmm. Unless yeah. you were like super mm -hmm. blessed, but yeah. like in, True. in being yeah. able to explore these different avenues of the creative space, you touched on something earlier about like the visual aspect of music for Bon Iver, that's so true. Like I didn't get into videography until I needed to do video work for my mm -hmm. band. Mm -hmm. And then through experiencing and cultivating a and reverse engineering what media had raised me to enjoy about visuals, yeah. Yeah. I started that's to right. discover that there's like a whole visual aspect of music that I don't know, I, I had never really kind of fully mm -hmm. tapped into even though it was developing subconsciously. Mm -hmm. So I, I wanted to say thank you guys for coming out and yeah. and coming on, I, I I would love to do like another. Th this has got to be yeah. a ten part series for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure this won't be the last time we'll talk. We, but like, yeah. you'll have us back. I mean, yeah, yeah certainly. We have more to say. I, I mean, keep talking. I'm yeah. really excited. Like, I, I got this. <laughs> the, the script on paper is we were talking about a person is not the paper that the resume. Hmm. You know, as I'm looking at the the script as I go over the first like two pages, I'm like, I didn't have any investment in it, but I can say right now that just from like this conversation, I think. I'm not only am I way more excited about it now to do it uh, and actively like looking forward to getting into this script read and the pre pre script read. Yeah. I'm really uh, excited that I, uh, in fostering my friendship with Pablo, I was able to bring Carlos into to live switches podcast. He was an aspiring filmmaker himself in Shout college and like at the point where he's at this early stage in his career. And I'm like showing him technical things yeah. that are going to help mm -hmm. him moving forward for yeah. right now in this yeah. part of his yeah. journey, but where he ends up as he he develops who what his architecture is going to be like. I just couldn't be more grateful to be in a room with like this is such a great yeah, calendar. Like agreed. Really like agreed. Pablo is off camera, but I'm I'm glad that he's <laughs> here. I'm glad that he connected us and brought you guys on. Yeah, uh, I'm really looking forward to getting into it. And if you guys are going to be back, we we should definitely schedule another one of these and do one in the future. I'd love to, especially post premiere. You know when you're yeah. doing around and doing the press junkets <laughs> in the yeah, circuit, yeah, man. Yeah. Don't forget, come back. We'll come we'll back. Do we'll do it. Yeah, we'll do an we'll event. Do it. 
Yeah, yeah. So yeah, give us the deets. Where can they find any information about like you guys individually, your handles on socials? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So again, my name is Jeremy Fight. My Instagram is my name, Jeremy Fight, F-E-I-G-H-T. No periods or anything. Uh, and my production company, which will be an active part of Beanie, is A World in Which Productions, which can also be found at that handle, A World in Which Productions. But those uh, pages are being built out. But stay on the lookout for that. And I'm sure Beanie things will <laughs> arrive on those pages. Yeah, for sure. Um, again, my name is Colette Girardin. Um, G-I-R-A-R-D-I-N. Tell it's, a, it's a really difficult, <laughs> it's a difficult name. Um, like Girardelli? I, well, you know, we, I, I often uh, uh, use Joe Girardi, but that's when I'm in New York. So yeah, it's yeah. hard to, <laughs> with an N. Um, but in any case, yes, you can find me on, on Instagram still with the, just the name. Well, thank you guys for coming on today. I'm thank really you. looking forward yeah. to getting into this. I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing when this film gets done in Agreed. May. Right? I mean, Same. me too. <laughs> We're Same. all so excited for that. Honestly, <laughs> like, can I go into like a frozen ice chamber and come out and it'd be done? Right. <laughs> Publish it, we're okay, done. All right, we're all gonna right. Go. Okay. that's a wrap. We did. Thank you, thank you, man. Thank you. Yeah, oh thanks for coming on. Yeah. We're always collaborating at all times with the universe. That is a wrap on another episode of the Collabor Die podcast. I hope you enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed making this episode for you. And now it's time for our favorite part of the show the part where I beg you to please hit that like button, subscribe, and turn on those notifications so you never miss an episode. And don't be shy. Give us a shout out on social media at Collaborate Eye Podcast on all the cool platforms to share your thoughts, your feedback, and your love. Until next time, Collaborate Eye, baby. <laughs>